Welcome everyone to this virtual Pro Pride session, Beyond Diversity Towards Dignity. This event is part of the 2021 virtual Pro Pride series put together by Pride at Work Canada, focused on moving beyond equity, diversity and inclusion. My name is Claire Yick, my pronouns are she and her, and I serve on the board of Pride at Work Canada. And in my day job, I work as a senior policy analyst with the BC Public Service based in BC. I'm really pleased to be your MC here today. And so whether it's the first time that you've attended a Pride at Work event or you join us every time, thank you. Uh, we're really happy to have you all here. Pride at Work Canada empowers employees, uh, employers to build workplaces that celebrate all employees, regardless of gender expression, gender identity, or sexual orientation. We provide education and training, create spaces for dialogue, and strategically through thought leadership, we help create safer, more inclusive workspaces that help realize the full potential of all employees while bringing down barriers to employment. Our events connect the most inclusive employers in Canada, and I'm proud to work for one of those. As we are a national organization, our events take place virtually uh, on the traditional territories of different First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And I can see in the chat already, many of you are sharing where you're calling in from. So I invite you to do that. We recognize that there are multiple systemic barriers that impact Two-Spirit and LGBTQ plus Indigenous folks from accessing meaningful, affirming, and inclusive employment. And we're working to reduce those barriers. So if you do have feedback for us, we're really open to that uh, so we can make that a reality. Uh, I'd like to recognize that our presenters all live on different territories across Turtle Island. Um, as some in the chat have mentioned, Pride at Work Canada's main office is located in Toronto or Dish with One Spoon territory. I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from Lekwungen territory, uh, whose people are now known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. As I am a settler on this land, one of my acts towards reconciliation is understanding language. So Lekwungen means place to smoke herring. Uh, when I go down to Beacon Hill Park near the water, there's a hill called Miken, which means warmed by the sun. And in learning more about this park, it used to be a settlement for the fence during war times and also an important reef net fishing area for all of those herring. There are also starchy bulbs from Camas wildflowers, which were an important food source uh, gathered by those that lived in the area. In my own personal reconciliation journey, I'm educating myself on various issues um, facing Indigenous folks in Canada, including missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry. This past Monday, uh, June 21st, was National Indigenous Peoples Day. And what a beautiful intersection of Indigenous History Month and Pride Month, uh, which is of great significance to Two-Spirit, Indigiqueer, and LGBTQ plus Indigenous members of our community. Um, Pride at Work did a great uh, post on this, and I think we can throw that in the chat in case you're looking for more links and, and resources for your journey. So again, I do invite you to type in the chat where you're calling in from and any reflections that you have on reconciliation. So for today's agenda, uh, first up was the welcome and I do hope that you feel welcomed. Um, we'll be thanking our community sponsor, which is the Inclusive Workplace Supply Council of Canada. We'll then be hearing remarks from Elder Albert McLeod and then we'll have our panel. And lastly, we'll close out with some resources. Just for some housekeeping, at the bottom of your screen, there is a closed captioning option available under subtitles, um, and that's being provided to us by National Captioning Canada. This session is being recorded and the registrants will be sent the link after. This session is in Zoom webinar mode, uh, which means that participants are able to use the chat and the Q&A box, um, but as much as I'd love to see your faces and hear your voices, you won't be able to turn your video or audio on. 
This session will last 90 minutes and end at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please connect with our team via chat. Um, this includes Pru Gurme and Jade Pichette. And if your questions are not answered during this session, you can feel free to email them in to info at prideatwork.ca. And keep that conversation going in the chat. It's an inclusive space. Um, and then if you do have a specific question for the panelists, please keep them in the Q&A so that they can be sorted and monitored. Happy Pride, everyone. So I just want to thank again, our community sponsor, the Inclusive Workplace Supply Council of Canada for helping make today's event a success and for their work promoting businesses run by veterans and people with disabilities. So business owners that um, the council supports, it's veterans and persons with disabilities, and there are countless examples of uh, abilities and achievements that deserve great admiration and respect. They're really proud to work with these entrepreneurs who exemplify what it means to be worthy of honor and respect. So today's event is focused on moving from diversity towards dignity. So shifting from that traditional equity, diversity, and uh, inclusion model to belonging, justice, and dignity. If you've been following along with the other Pro Pride events, um, you'll, you may have seen earlier this month, we're moving beyond inclusion towards belonging. Today's session is moving beyond diversity towards dignity. And next month, there's still time to register for beyond equity towards justice. So while diversity changes who's in the room, not everyone may feel welcome or able to honor their full selves. Dignity recognizes that all of us are worthy of honor and respect. And I just wanna underscore that again, and I'm speaking to all of you individually at this point, you are worthy. One way that we can see creating dignity requires that we communicate with each other uh, with curiosity and compassion looking to call people in instead of calling them out. That is to create a dialogue which would provide the opportunity for both of us to grow and know the impact of uh, our actions. We're all on this learning journey and we're all learning together. It's only when everyone has their dignity recognized that we can honor 2S LGBTQIA plus employees and job seekers as our authentic selves. And again, in the spirit of reconciliation, in the recently released 2021 Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and 2S LGBTQIA People National Action Plan, the first guiding principle in this national action plan focuses on reclaiming the power, place, and dignity of Indigenous women, girls, and 2S LGBTQIA people. Dignity honors our full authentic selves and allows us to participate in creating welcoming workplaces. So today we get to hear from a panel of experts who are working to create dignity for gender, romantic and sexual minorities in the workplace. To start that today, we're grateful that Elder Albert McLeod will be opening our discussion in a good way. Albert uses he, him, she, her pronouns and is one of the directors of the Two-Spirited People of Manitoba, a community-based organization focused on helping Indigenous LGBTQ2S folks improve their lives. Albert is a status Indian with ancestry from the Sichuan Asik, Cree Nation, and the Métis community of Norway House in Northern Manitoba. He has 30 plus years of experience as a human rights advocate activist and began his two-spirit advocacy in Winnipeg in 1986 and became an HIV AIDS activist in 1987. He was the director of the Manitoba Aboriginal AIDS Task Force from 1991 to 2001 and holds an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Winnipeg. Albert lives in Winnipeg where he works as a consultant specializing in Indigenous peoples cultural reclamation and cross-cultural training. Welcome, Albert. 
Thank you, Claire, and welcome everyone uh, to this uh, event. I want to acknowledge all of you uh, who are on the panel, as well as those who are joining us virtually, and, and recognize you uh, for the gifts that you carry. And that is a traditional Indigenous uh, worldview that everyone who joins the circle is considered to have a purpose, a role, a destiny, and possess a divine gift. And so as we discuss these issues around um, employment in various sectors, whether it is private, uh, corporate, civil government, um, or nonprofit sector, and the inclusion of uh, you know, people who are LGBTQ2+, uh, and those issues of navigating you know, the uh, oppression that uh, we've experienced over the last you know, 100 years of Canada's colonization, and uh, considering that um, uh, employment is an uh, inherent right as a Canadian citizen, but also it's a determinant of health. And that uh, from my history, you know, uh, I was experienced racism and homophobia in the small town I was raised in in the north and I quit school uh, in grade 10. So again, my trajectory was already being affected negatively by social uh, attitudes towards gays or indigenous people. However, you know, my employment history goes back 40 years. Uh, and despite that disruption, I've managed to, you know, be employed uh, sometimes, you know, uh, with my, uh, you know, sexual identity or sexual orientation known and in other cases uh, not known. But again, I think as we move forward uh, in Canada today, uh, we have some uh, sort of uh, pathways to follow as well, such as, as Claire mentioned, uh, you know, the idea of decolonization and reconciliation. And again, that will influence uh, the workplace, uh, particularly for two-spirit people. And then recently, uh, you know, uh, the bill uh, that prohibits uh, conversion therapy passed in our parliament. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, talk about that, that, uh, you know, the isms, whether it's, you know, and phobias intersect in our society. And the work that we do is really dismantling them and, and realizing as, you know, a civil society, we have the right to do that. We have the right to advocate. And I know that the word advocate is <laughs> kind of taboo these days, but, but certainly, uh, for the LGBTQ2 community and has served us well in making these safer spaces uh, for ourselves over the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so that we have that right to, uh, you know, to be employed, you know, to be educated, to have a career, um, you know, to have an interest in our society. And that, you know, we've come a long way in providing those tools that make uh, these spaces safe and safer. Uh, we have legislation, which are the laws uh, in our society, as well as policies uh, that aim to provide these spaces so that everybody can participate in our society, in our nation, the work of our nation. And so I welcome you all to this circle. And as, a, as we're guided by our knowledge keepers that as, as humans, you know, we have to acknowledge the natural world in which we live. And which in which we survive. So th that is the world that gives us life, the water, uh, the sky, the plants and the animals. And to remind us that we, we don't exist in isolation, that we have a, an obligation and a relationship with the natural world, as well as the world of our ancestors that have given us these gifts that we carry into the present uh, in the 21st century that we can also relate to them, even though they may have passed, that we still have a spiritual relationship uh, with our ancestors. And so I welcome you everybody today to be a part of this conversation, uh, to, uh, to learn about each other and also to learn about how our society is structured and what places we have uh, for LGBTQ2 Canadians uh, to, again, uh, to experience, you know, uh, uh, the beauty of our society, the beauty of our, our country, 
and to live good lives. So thank you, uh, thank you, Claire. And, uh, welcome to the panel. Thank you so much, Albert. So now we are moving on uh, to our panel and I'll be introducing our moderator. So here we have Colin Duran, and it's been a pleasure to work with you, Colin, over the past two and a half years. Um, Colin's pronouns are he, him, and he's a business strategist with more than 15 years of experience uh, working with two-spirit LGBTQ plus communities. Uh, he's served as our executive director of Product Work Canada since 2014. He's the vice chair of Volunteer Toronto, Canada's largest volunteer center, and is on the advisory board of the Diversity Institute at the Ted Rogers School of Management. Originally from Cole Harbor, Nova Scotia, Colin received a BFA from NASCAD University and has completed executive education programs at both Rotman and Harvard, Harvard Business School. Welcome, Colin. So excited to hear from you and the panelists. Thank you, Claire, both for uh, your uh, skills as an MC today and for your service on Pride of Work Canada's Board of Directors over the past few years. And thank you so much, Albert, for your opening remarks and uh, for sharing both your knowledge and advice on how we can uh, dismantle that which keeps so many from fully participating in society. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today uh, speaking to you from the territory of the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the uh, Potawatomi First Nations uh, on our topic of moving from diversity towards dignity. Uh, I know that everybody's very active in the chat today and I love to see that. I just wanna let everybody know that in order to focus on my conversation with our outstanding panelists, I'm not gonna be able to keep tabs on what's in the chat. Um, but as Claire mentioned, if you do have a question, we have some time for those at the very end of our conversation. And I would encourage you to submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. That helps us keep track of the questions that come in. Uh, and I'll be able to look there to uh, hopefully get an answer from one of our panelists um, after our conversation. Uh, like I said, I'm really excited um, for this specific conversation. Uh, the topic of dignity is one that's quite close to my heart. And I wanna introduce our panelists and have them each share uh, their definition or what comes to mind for them when they think about dignity in the area of employment. Um, but first I'll perhaps share why uh, you know, dignity is so important to me. Um, as Claire mentioned, I was born in uh, Nova Scotia. My first job was in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia where I grew up um, at a local burger place. Uh, knowing that I wanted to go into sales um, out of high school, I really wanted to work on the cash register. I thought that I was really good with people. I thought it would be a really good experience. Uh, I was told by my manager at 16 years old that my voice was too gay for me to work with customers. I was told that it wasn't the image that the restaurant wanted um, for the public. Uh, and it was a while later after, you know, I made a really good impression on one of the assistant managers that she actually afforded me the dignity of moving me up front to work with customers from the back. And uh, for me, I went from, I think, making 550 to 565 an hour, but the 15 cents an hour raise was not the big deal. It was the fact that I got to smile, make people laugh, talk to them and wear a name tag. Uh, so that just simple act of affording me the dignity of doing something um, that somebody said I wasn't able to do because of who I was, was really my first encounter with today's topic in the workplace. Uh, so I'm really excited to speak with our outstanding panelists um, about uh, both their accomplishments and their views uh, on today's topic. Uh, perhaps first I'll introduce uh, Ryan Cooper. Um, so we can move to seeing Ryan's uh, uh, Ryan's video and uh, Ryan's accomplishments up on the screen. Um, Ryan um, uh, is a co-CEO of Rainy Storm Productions Incorporated. And as you can see um, from their uh, biographical information on the screen, quite accomplished in the area of television and film. Uh, Ryan, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And can you please share with our audience your views on today's topic, perhaps what dignity means to you in the area of employment in the workplace? 
Hi, uh, absolutely. I just want to say, first off, like, thank you to Credit Work Canada for making this panel possible and everybody that is a part of this panel and everybody watching. Thank you all so much. Um, what it means to me. So I, I grew up in a pretty uh, entrepreneurial mindset. I lived on my community of Pegasus First Nation pretty much for my entire life. Um, so I, I, I didn't realize that it was, a, you know, I knew that I was uh, different is what my uh, teachers used to tell me. Uh, I didn't really know what that meant uh, until I got older and I really started to like understand uh, that I was uh, two-spirit and I actually learned from my teacher in school what that was and um, really focusing on that and learning about that. And uh, every time I created a new job, I used like, I started working at like 12 years old delivering newspapers and morning lawns and babysitting and all of these things and started a little business with other youngsters and all that kind of stuff. So I always like remembered going to towards people of the LGBT two-spirit community and asking them if they wanted to help make this little business possible. So it was always kind of like second nature for me personally. Like I never, I, I helped my parents with their businesses as well and, you know, made it very inclusive with who we hired. Um, and it was really, and my parents also taught me how to you know, respect everyone for their differences as well. So, yeah, I mean, like that was a really great learning for my parents and and growing up with dignity at the core of everything that I've done. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Colin. That's, that's, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks for sharing your perspective on today's topic. I'm really happy that you were able to share um, that personal information um, from your childhood and, and growing up. We look forward to hearing more of you as we as we uh, continue the conversation. Uh, but next we'll introduce um, Aaron, uh, our friend from Finning. Um, maybe we can move Aaron's uh, information up on, on screen here. Thank you. Uh, Aaron is the Global Director of Inclusion and Diversity at Finning International. Uh, and as you can see, we've got some of Aaron's accomplishments up on the screen here. Aaron, if you could please um, unmute yourself, um, share your <laughs> Sorry, and uh, and share your views uh, on today's topic uh, of yeah. dignity. Yeah, thanks so much, Colin. And I echo Ryan's comments. Uh, thank you so much for including me. This is a, an area that I'm I'm passionate about, both both personally and professionally. I think for me, you know, dignity it, it's it's rooted in this respect uh, factor, and and sometimes, especially currently. Uh, the topic of diversity and inclusion can be so polarizing, right? There's just such a, a multitude of views and beliefs out there, but I don't know anyone who doesn't, um, you know, believe in the need to feel respected and feel that sense of um, dignity. Um, and, you know, throughout my career and, and also upbringing, similar to Ryan, I, I was raised in a fairly uh, religious, um, misogynist, homophobic type of upbringing, very traditional values. And very quickly, I started to understand that there was like a ranking of hierarchy um, in society. And I saw the damage that that did to me and some of, of my community um, in terms of our feelings of self-worth and value. And I, I truly believe that every single individual on this planet has the power to drive um, for the collective good and contribute for the strength of our communities. But if we have a society that isn't recognizing you know, and treating each individual with that dignity and respect, we actually tear away and erode at that power inside of each of us. So for me, dignity is really about the act of respect, um, recognizing that every single person is, is deserving of love and value. And if we can try to anchor in that common need for dignity and respect, just think of the power that we can uh, drive together. So that, that's my sound bite, but really looking forward to getting into the, into the conversation with the panelists. Thanks so much, Colin. Thank you, Erin. I think that's a really beautiful sentiment to start us off, uh, tying that to the value of respect to personal value. I think it's wonderful. I look forward to hear more of your views um, as we continue our conversation. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ivan Coyote. Um, maybe we can have Ivan's accomplishments um, put up on the screen. And Ivan, I invite you um, to share your video uh, and your audio um, so that we can hear a little bit about um, your uh, personal views or uh, perspective on today's topic of dignity as it pertains to employment in the workplace. 
Hi, Colin. Thanks. I'm not seeing my video, but I have uh, unmuted my video. So um, should I just continue? Yeah, we can see you perfectly, Ivan. Thanks. Okay, maybe I'll change my view here. Oh, oh there we go. Okay, there I am. Um, yeah, uh, my name's Ivan Coyote, and I'm, I'm joining you from uh, the Kwanlin Dun and Tahan Kwachin Council uh, territories in Whitehorse, Yukon, where I was born and raised. And um, I'm home for the summer. And yeah, I, for me, especially in terms of the workplace as a trans person, um, and even before I transitioned as a, a female assigned person working in a not so-called non-traditional, uh, I was an electrician and I worked in trades, uh, landscaper before that, um, and some construction. And I really love that work, uh, but I and I never struggled with the work itself. I never struggled with the physical component. I always, always struggled with the facilities and the culture in the workplace. And for me, you know, access to, I, we just have access to basically washrooms and change rooms, um, you know, in terms of my workplace has always been a consistent struggle. And I feel like having to advocate for something as basic a human need as a washroom or a change room consistently over and over again in every workplace that I've ever, ever worked in. Um, uh, that is such an undignified thing to, to repeatedly force an employee to do. And so I guess if you wanted to widen the lens, it, you know, uh, providing for the basic human needs and above and beyond a bathroom, to me, that's 101. That's literally bottom line. But if you want to truly like diversify your workforce and, and make it a, a, a more welcoming and safe bracket or bracket place, uh, you have to provide for those for those basic elements of support for for the individual humanity of each of your employees, whatever that might be, and not constantly put the work to advocate for that back on the individual. It's not fair to have to show up at work, be the only trans person, be the only indigenous person if that's who, who you are, be the only two spirit person, be the only black person, and then have to also on top of that advocate for something as basic as a washroom or you know for your your the pronunciation of your name, uh, things like that. Um, uh, to me and to me they're um, almost frustratingly simple at this point that we are still having to advocate for such basic things um, in order to fully participate in something as, like Albert was saying, as, uh, as important to your future trajectory as solid, um, well-paid employment is with access to all the things that that brings, stability, healthcare, you know, resources. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there for now. Great, thanks, Ivan. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your views on how we can unburden folks um, just by giving them the basic needs um, that they have at work. Um, that's great. I will actually go back to you, Ivan, for our first uh, question. Um, I know that your work often dresses having a sense of uh, community. And speaking of your work, um, I know that you've been quite busy because your book just came out. So this is just my plug for Care Of by Ivan Coyote. Um, you might want to purchase it maybe while you're listening today um, and have it delivered to your door. Um, you know, your work often addresses having a sense of uh, community. And I know that we have a lot of folks who are on the line today who perhaps lack a sense of community in their workplace or they're in the process of building uh, community in their workplace. Uh, what advice would you have uh, for those folks? Well, okay, just jump right in, hey. Um, I think that I think that uh, we have to start looking at community as more of a reciprocal relationship. Um, I had a student uh, in my this last semester um, in one of my classes at Western where I was teaching, and you know he uh, I remember him saying, "Oh, I, I want this." I, I, he he was unhappy. He wanted more technical uh, skills to be dealt with in the class, but it was a it was a live performance class, and he said, "This is what I need." And you said that this was going to be an artist. This class was going to be a, an artistic community where I could come and get my needs met. And I said, "Well, 
<laughs> let's this was in a private set in a like a uh, like a, a, a student hour session and I said well let, time out for a second let's take a look at what if everybody came to the community to the concept of community only looking to have their needs met that's an unsustainable model for a community um completely unsustainable and the people it's going to burn out the quickest and the most and the deepest are the people who actually bring the most to the community they will be only taken from and the and a community is not a library that you go to withdraw resources from and return them when you're done community is an active um, act of love and engagement and and then i also think of my friend bet who was one of my sort of butch mentors i remember her saying to me one time community also includes the person that you want there the least and so um so i guess i guess i guess i'd like us to start approaching community and i think we i think queer youth do this they approach community as a place that they're going to get their needs met and they don't understand that it's actually reciprocal and that they have much to bring and that the whole community will benefit if everybody enters community thinking about not just what they need and what's important to them um, and their requirements for engagement, but what they bring to the table and what they have to offer and how they can help, you know, and this, this comes around a lot when you start talking about mentorship and um and eldership and um uh, and, and and guiding the youth um uh if it's approached consistently by e either party as a one-way street i really feel that it's we're not doing justice to those relationships and you know there's all kinds of stuff online about how to be a good mentor and there's a, there's a real dearth of 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 knowledge about how to be a good mentee and what you bring to that relationship and how you reciprocate and respect the person who's giving you their knowledge. Um, so I guess I think I, I, I'm starting to really try to come to all engagements, uh, thinking about not just what I'm there to get, but what I'm there to give and what that, how that, how I can facilitate that exchange in the, in the most positive, um, least harmful, uh, respectful and and approach it all with integrity and i guess that's my that's my advice great so community through a series of gives and gets where respect is reciprocal i love that ivan thank you so much for sharing uh, um, your perspective i wouldn't say gives and gets i think i think that's boiling it down to something that's still a currency exchange as opposed to a energy exchange not to sound too hippie because I'm in the Yukon <laughs> but um, yeah I, I wouldn't say gives or gets uh, like that's not how I would choose to sum that up but essentially I guess we're, we're agreeing. Thanks Ivan. Ryan in terms of um, creating a sense of community um, as a as somebody as a producer uh, you create spaces where people have to work together and collaborate uh, to create a creative product um, can you talk a little bit about your approach to creating those spaces and how you build a sense of community and uh, dignity for the folks that are working with you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that question. As a producer, I, um, as a filmmaker, as a person that got into film, I joined these uh, programs, projects, uh, you know, sets that were all kind of this hierarchical structure. It was really hard for me to like understand that structure because I come from a First Nation community and we our structure is very circle where we hold hands and everybody is you know equal regardless of what job they do. Um, so coming into that kind of like system that I that I just mentioned this like film industry system that has like been this way since like dawn of filmmaking it didn't work for me it doesn't work for indigenous people like at least in my perspective in my community um so when i became a producer and started producing my own stuff and making my own stuff i always thought about like well i want to bring it back to community i want everybody to feel involved i want everybody to feel loved i want everybody to feel supported and that's exactly what i did and we changed the structure of how a set works like we're a family we're all working together to create this product 
that's going to be meaningful to so many people because we and I put everything in pieces of who I am. What there's my indigeneity, my realism as an indigenous person, all of these things I, I put little pieces of myself into these these projects and you know I invite everybody who's working on sets to like also you know give their two cents of what feel should be done in terms of the project that we're working on if there's a, a better way to more you know sensitive to the things we're talking about and are working on um created this like amazing wonderful place and you know I created a room recently that was all diverse communities, uh, not just Indigenous community, but I wanted to include everybody, like as an Indigenous producer, and as just an Indigenous person, I feel very like, I felt very pushed out of things just five years ago. Um, and when I moved into like this world five years ago and kind of like really figuring out what that is, I kind of saw the invisible lines that people were being kept from coming in. So I wanted to like shatter those lines and that's exactly what I did. And invited people in that wouldn't have had a chance um, otherwise, or if they did have a chance, they would have to work for years and years and years to get a chance. But uh, like, I think it's really important that everybody have a chance and, and you know, the team and yeah, that's the kind of mentality that I have around filmmaking and kind of everything that I do in life, honestly. And just in, in terms of what Ivan had said too, like, I think everything you said was golden. It was so perfect. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to Pegasus today too. We're actually doing our Pride Parade, the first one ever, um, this on the 26th. And right after this panel, I'm going helping build that flow. So that's going to be exciting. What a great day. Sorry. Uh, so yeah. I, Great. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, it's it's great to hear that you're kind of bringing that entrepreneurial spirit that you talked about from your childhood and your youth uh, into the work that you're doing now and building those environments that are truly collaborative. So thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, I'll go on um, to Aaron, um, who Aaron works at Finning International. And Aaron, I hope you don't mind me saying that, you know, I think a lot of people might look at the industry that you work in manufacturing, you know, creating a lot of uh, tools that are used in skilled trades and might not immediately associate that with the most inclusive environment. Um, so as the person who's in charge of uh, developing and, and fostering and uh, cultivating an inclusive environment at Finning International, uh, you know, how do you do that? And, and how do you approach your work with that sense of dignity and respect that you spoke about in our opening? Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, so it's it's been a, a journey for us. And I would say, you know, in, in the simplest form, I work to rally everyone around a common goal and a com common objective. And I think it speaks to the power of community rather than hierarchy. You know, we, we early on uh, developed a campaign to help leaders believe in the why, like why this was so important, what was to, you know, gain, but also what was at risk if we didn't, you know, treat treat this seriously in terms of a, a multi-year strategy with measurable um, you know, measures of success and a roadmap of actions um, led by leaders. And so I could go on and on about that strategy, but I, I think why we were successful is we anchored it in something that we all had in common, which was safety in the industrial context. And I mean, we're in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, UK, Ireland, as well as across Canada. And safety is, is really important, um, but we had always been talking about safety at fitting in the physical context. And what I introduced was the psychological context of safety and how in order to achieve psychological safety, which is directly correlated to physical safety, we needed to really start to empower leaders and equip leaders to be interrupting disrespectful and unsafe discriminatory bullying types of behaviors in order to protect the psychological safety of our employees. So we really started there. And then we built upon that foundation of respect to then talk about, okay, then what does it mean to be inclusive, which is to draw on the diverse perspectives and the diverse talent to identify first the risks and the barriers and work collaboratively to resolve them and then gain 
Um, and, you know, I heard earlier, you know, Ivan was speaking about the washrooms. That was one of the first things we tackled. We, we talked to our union and, and we talked to our employees and our underrepresented talent. We said, you know, what are some of the big barriers right in your way? And, and what's the one thing you would change? And we heard, like, we need washrooms for our women. We need, you know, change rooms. And uh, it was startling for some of our leaders to realize that we had facilities throughout the world that, you know, our women couldn't feel safe changing in. And so we very quickly did a global audit of all of our facilities and also started piloting more um, inclusive personal protective equipment for all sizes and genders uh, to ensure that individuals felt that dignity and respect when they showed up on the job so that they could focus on operating safely as opposed to worrying, okay, where's the nearest washroom? Um, so yeah, we, we really anchored it in that, that safety context and built from there as opposed to polarizing the population too quickly on um, some complicated and tricky topics. We didn't want people to feel a fear of stepping into this space. We wanted to help them dip their toe and get comfortable and, and then find their power in it. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Erin. I, yeah, I'm really struck by um, what you're talking about creating environments where uh, you know people feel psychologically safe, and just those messages that you send through those measures that you're introducing in the workplace create that psychological safety. And I think one of the things that you know, one of the statements or, or phrases that's pretty well worn in this community is this idea of bringing your whole self to work. And when you talk about creating that psychologically safe environment. I think that really illustrates how that's not something that just helps employees. It also helps employers because it encourages more full participation uh, in the workplace. So thank you so much for sharing um, some of those practices that you've instituted. We're really looking forward to hearing more from you. Uh, I'll go back to Ivan um, since we we're talking about some skilled trades environments. Ivan. Um, you know, just like me, you grew up in an environment uh, with a family of uh, tradespeople, uh, and you've worked in trades uh, throughout your lifetime. Um, can you give us any insight into, you spoke a little bit uh, before about kind of, um, you know, covering folks' basic needs and going beyond. What are some things that you've noticed from your experience um, that, you know, folks could do in skilled trades to create better environments where people can feel safe? Well, I'm a storyteller. That's my <clears throat> that's my bag. So I'm just gonna tell a story. Uh, I just think that's the best way to get your point across most times. And so I want to take you back to 1992 when I had just graduated top of my class valedictorian from Electricity Industrial Electronics Program at British Columbia Institute of Technology, where I was one of. Now I'm a trans person, so I don't want to. Uh, I, I was assigned female at birth. So I was one of two female assigned people in 650 uh, uh, trades, tradesmen um, while I was going to, to, to school. And then when I got out of school, um, I went to work on a 156 unit uh, condominium complex in Surrey. And I was uh, carpooling out there with my boss and um, so there was all, all kinds of active trades happening uh, at different stages. So there was roofers and um, stucco guys and uh, electricians. I was working as an electrician, plumber, crew, plumbers, crews. There was landscapers. There were multiple crews, multiple languages, um, multiple everything, and uh, two outhouses um, for probably upwards of about 400 trades, mostly tradesmen. There was me um, who identified as kind of, I don't know what I identified as back then, but beat me younger without, with less words to describe myself, I'd say. And then a female plumber, uh, a, a woman plumber apprentice, a third year apprentice. And her and I were the only non uh, cisgendered men on the entire job site, um, except for sometimes the first aid attendant would be a woman. But other than that, we were the only ones. So we were expected to share filthy, filthy outhouses, two of them with 400 dudes. And it was so, and I'm, I'm not OCD, but uh, I'm tidy. And uh, I could not stomach, literally could not stomach those. Uh, so I, I walked, uh, I spent my entire lunch hour, I'd eat my sandwich 
and my juice box on the way there. And I would walk in my coveralls or my work clothes along the number one highway outside of Surrey to, and then cross it before there was a crossing there, duck across the highway to use the bathroom at the Tim Hortons where I was inevitably hassled by some lady in there as well because I was wearing work clothes and I looked like I look. And then I would turn around and go back and sometimes be five minutes late getting back to work just to access a bathroom. Um, that I could tolerate at all. And then, so myself and the female, again, having to advocate for ourselves constantly. So it's not enough that I'm the only me and she's the only her. And, and the interesting thing was, is that we spent all of our breaks together, even though we had absolutely nothing in common other than the fact that we were not dudes. We were the only two not dudes. She was a plumber, I was an electrician. She liked country music and like going to rodeos. And I was like a queer activist and she was kind of homophobic, but we all we had was each other. And we kind of became these weird, like non-consensual friends. Like we didn't really like each other, but we were sort of stuck together by circumstance. Anyway, we got together and we went and talked to the, the general contractor and said, look, like this isn't good enough and we need, a, we need our own Biffy. And so they, they hummed and hawed for a week or so. And then this shiny new, new outhouse showed up and the rest of the dudes like hated us that we had a clean bathroom and every t there was cocks drawn all over the outside and sometimes someone would go in there and just piss all over everything and it was just there it was nasty right and then i realized like uh, you know um there was a lot of dudes who hated those bathrooms too right like they were nasty and disgusting and and like just because we're tradespeople, just because we're blue collar people doesn't mean that we, you know, don't want to wash our hands and, and uh, you know, and, and two washrooms for 400 people is never going to be enough. I don't care what gender you are or how tidy you are or how good your aim is or whatever. Like, it's just not enough. And so what we were advocating for was not just ourselves, but again, just the basic human dignity of every single person on that job site, regardless of their gender. Right. And so. Um, uh, and that was the same job site where I was, I got caught in the underground parking lot after, after everybody had gone home and I had a, what I, what I think, and I trust my instinct or what I think was a very close call with a multiple sexual assault. Um, I got cornered by some stucco guys, uh, in the underground parking after everyone was gone and we hadn't finished wiring all the fluorescent lights. So there was just brewery cord. It was kind of dull and dank. And luckily it was a Friday afternoon and I brought my electrical pouch with me and I just reached around and I grabbed my big, long knockout punch, nasty, dull, flathead screwdriver and I just looked at the guy who seemed there was I think six or seven of them and I just looked at the guy who seemed like he was uh the most um uh, in charge of what was going on they had surrounded around me um uh, I didn't understand uh the language that they were speaking and um but I knew what they were saying anyway and it wasn't good looking good for me so I just held up my screwdriver and said okay are you first so come at me bro basically because if this is going to happen, like someone's getting a screwdriver in the ribs and um, they sort of laughed it off and uh, and let me go. And I got into the truck with my with my journeyman, with my uh, supervisor. And he was like, are you are you OK? And I was like, yeah, just just drive like I just it's Friday. Just I want to go home. I'm going to have a beer. I want to put my feet up. I just I don't even. And he, we were stuck in traffic, though, because we were late leaving and um, so we got stuck in traffic and we were talking. I finally told him what happened. And he was like, oh, I'm gonna go to the general contractor and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that whole stucco crew fired and this is nonsense. And I was like, oh yeah. And then they're gonna love me after that, right? And again, like, it's not just that you have to advocate for your own human dignity. It's the consequences of having to do that because then you're the queer dyke, trans, butch, whatever you are, who's, who's now being a pain in the ass. Now you want a bathroom. Now you want to not be gang raped. Like what's next. And uh, so, you know, that just that constant having to, to advocate for yourself. And it in fact chased me out of my trade, which I loved. And I was a really good electrician. I was, I, and I, I'm wiring my cabin right now and remembering like how much I just love my trade. And so uh, what ended up happening was they moved me off that job site and we were supposed to start another uh, contract. 
um, because my boss, di he disregarded my, my, re my request to just leave it be. And instead of firing the, 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 the potential gang rape stucco crew, um, they just moved me because it was easier to move me than it was to move a crew of dudes. So they just, and that job ended up being delayed. And so I had a couple of weeks and that's, I got asked to go work electrics in the film industry. And so that day was turned out to be my last official day as a, as a journeyman electrician. Um, I went to work in the film industry after that. And I, and I truly, truly deeply feel, and I'm tough. Like I I'm tough. I'm thick skinned. I can put up with like 5,000 microaggressions. Although I do want to know how many microaggressions make a macroaggression. Is it metric or standard? I don't know. But anyway, um, I I'm tough and, and I got chased out of my trade. Um, uh, and it was not because I was not competent and it was not because I was not good at my job. It was because I literally could not tolerate and, um, and so I think about how are we going to change the environment in workplaces if we chase out all the good people who actually want to bring different culture, different, you know, my more diverse, if, if we just make it, you know, you can say, oh, yeah, you can't discriminate against someone, but you can make their workplace so hostile that they leave. And that's harder to pin down. And it's certainly harder to, to legislate around. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you so much for um, illustrating uh, some of your views by using personal stories. I know sometimes it's not the easiest uh, thing to do. So really appreciate you sharing that uh, with our audience. Um, I know that um, mentions of uh, violence and threats of violence um, may trigger some people in our audience. And if um, you require support, uh, we really encourage you to reach out to Jade Pichette. Um, they're available in the chat. You can private message them as well as uh, Prue or Micah or Luis, who are also members of our staff. They'd be really happy to speak privately with you. Uh, but thanks again, Ivan, very much for, for sharing that. We appreciate your honesty. Uh, Ryan, I'm gonna move. Oh, sorry, Ivan, did you have something else to say? I just wanted to say, maybe I, I possibly should have said like content uh, summary. Um, I should, maybe should have given a heads up, I, my, my apologies. Oh, no apologies necessary for your honesty, Ivan. We're really uh, pleased that you shared the story and we have our staff members here to provide support um, if required uh, for, for just such an instance. So thank you very much again for your honesty. Uh, Ryan, um, you know, speaking, um, Ivan just mentioned film industry and, you know, kind of shifting gears from um, skilled trades to creative, uh, creative workplaces. I think similar to what I discussed about stereotypes about skilled trades environments um, not being inclusive, I feel that there also could be a stereotype that creative environments are very inclusive, uh, which may not always be the case. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what that, you know, the outward impression that folks might have of production or creative environments versus the reality uh, for marginalized people working in creative industries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to say, Ivan, thanks for sharing that story. That was amazing. And, and it, I definitely have stories like that, too, working in this industry, uh, especially with the microaggressions, not necessarily about being too spirited, but also more or less about being uh, indigenous and it was it's hard it's really really hard sometimes to get up in the morning and think that you want to do something that you love but then knowing that it's not a safe environment and it's it's really hard um but in terms of yeah like I I, I think that people have this notion of uh just because we're creatives and queer and uh you know uh out of the box in terms of what the film industry is um, they think that we all are this homogenous kind of like, oh, it's like love everybody and it's not the case. Um, a lot of the times, like I said, though, like never, and I never really not felt safe in, in the, the creative space as a two-spirited person, but I felt very unsafe as an Indigenous person in the microaggressions that I had in terms of like being on set one time and I was standing in the in the bush because it was a scene within the forest and somebody said, oh, I see that you're in your natural habitat. And I'm like, what what does that mean like because i'm indigenous i belong in the bush like is that what you is that what you mean and then he just like laughed and walked away and um it was a really hard thing for me to hear that was the first time uh that was my first day on set and the first time i ever got a gig to work on set so it was like oh man is this what i'm gonna have to deal with for the rest of like me working on set um and it was hard it was a hard like realization for me to understand but i decided to like 
push through and become the best that I can possibly be and run sets so that I know that that kind of shit doesn't happen. Um, and that's exactly what I feel like I'm trying to do now. Like I said earlier, I created this writer's room with a, a ton of different like minorities, sexualities, identities. Um, and it was, we all sat and cried together because we never felt so safe before. Um, and it was a really powerful moment. And that's what I want to do. And it's not, it wasn't just me, it was also my business partner, Mary Lou Mintram, who is, you know, a part of my company, Rainy Storm Productions as well. And she's amazing. And I'm so happy that we found each other. And, um, and we have to fight all the time to, to, to share our own narrative. Um, because our, I feel like people, uh, not people, but just like these institutions don't think that we can tell our own stories when you know, we were born on the res. You could probably tell that I have a pretty heavy res accent. And I'm so freaking proud of that because it, it shows where I'm from. So, and people immediately know that I'm from Pegwis because I, of the words that I use, the lingo that I talk with. They're like, oh, you're from Pegwis. I'm like, yep, yes, I am. Um, so it's nice, but in terms of working on set outside of me becoming a producer, it was it was hard. It was really, really hard. Um, and, you know, I had horrible things happen to, I had a staple remover thrown at me at one point. Um, it was just a really hard industry to be a part of. And I, it, again, it goes back to that hierarchy structure that I want to dismantle. And, um, I feel like I am. And also like, just, just a shout out to Albert McLeod as well as you, uh, you know, learning about what being two-spirited is, uh, like I learned a lot from Albert in terms of everything that he wrote and all the panels that he's been on. And, um, so it's really nice to be on a panel with you. So just so you know, um, and it feels, I feel kind of, I don't know, just like, I feel like a fangirl, but it's okay. Cause I, I think it's cool. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, I hope I answered your question. That's kind of like how it was for me in my experience. Yeah, absolutely answers the question, Ryan. I think, you know, I really am grateful to both you and Ivan for, you know, sharing uh, stories about your personal pain, but also your personal resilience. I think that's really important for everybody to hear about. Uh, and we really, really appreciate your honesty uh, about your experiences in your industry and really happy to see that that resilience has um, resulted in a lot of success for you. And uh, we really appreciate that so much. Uh, Aaron, um, you know, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm also just going to encourage folks if you have questions, make sure that you use the Q&A function because we're going to move into doing a few questions with our panelists from you, the audience, um, after this. So make sure in order for me to capture them, you use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, but Aaron, you know, what Ivan and Ryan both described were uh, environments in which there was diversity because they were present and they were not perhaps in the majority in those environments. Um, but there perhaps what it wasn't the most inclusive or you know dignified experience for them because of the actions of their colleagues. So I know that our events attract a lot of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals like yourself. And you know, thinking about those environments where they are quite diverse, but perhaps not very inclusive, what advice would you have based on your experience at Finning International? Yeah, thanks, Colin. I think the point that I that I want to start from is, you know, going back to the conversation around the energy exchange. And I agree, it's not a transactional give and get, but yet there is an energy flowing in and out and we're all human beings. And if you think about, you know, you know, individuals who go through a traumatic experience or you hear of someone's traumatic experience, think about the feelings that that rises up, right? There's anger. And what I really want to try to explore a bit more is like, if we take that anger and translate it into passion, there's a lot of discretionary energy there. And if we think about who has power, which can also be seen as energy, and who doesn't have power, how do we start to influence the system to rebalance the power so that everyone has energy to give? Um, and so when I think about the role formally in the DNI space, it's how do you use the systems of power within the organization to break down the barriers and create a place where everyone has power together, because together we will have more power as an organization, how, whatever the size, that can be a community, that can be a family, that can be a company, but it's all a system. 
Okay. And so, you know, you know, I'm very fortunate because we have the power of our board and our CEO behind us. We have a tremendous amount of executive sponsorship. So I have the distinct pleasure and responsibility to use that power in a way that's going to transform the organization, both in the culture perspective around behaviors, as well as systems like policy and, and, and process changes. And so for me, I'm constantly looking, okay, where are the gaps that I need to use and channel the power to close the gap? And how do I prioritize the gaps based on the needs of the organization? And so what I've tried to do is collapse the hierarchy and, and amplify the voices to empower those underrepresented folks and marginalized folks to help shine a spotlight on the priorities, help inform where are the gaps that we need to you know, channel the prior, channel the power. Because I see our CEO, he's so passionate about this. He wants to drive the change at a faster pace than, than we have. Um, and so my eyes and ears are really through the lens of our community. We've been able to grow our Allies for Inclusion community to over 800 individuals around the globe. And we leverage that community and empower that community to help drive the change at Finning but through the leaders. So we've really driven the accountability for this programming through our executive leaders who have the power, but in, in concert, we're empowering the voices of the individuals who are impacted. So I've, I've really tried to think about it of, of a system and how do we rebalance the power? And it's not about taking anything away from anyone. It's actually about how do we use the power that exists to empower others so that we're more powerful together. And when you think of it that way, um, it can be exciting. It doesn't need to be a zero sum game for anybody. Um, you know, Ivan, you mentioned how, you know, the, the dudes didn't want a dirty uh, uh, porta potty either, right? And, and dudes don't want to be disrespected either. And, and we're all, we all as human beings have that universal need to feel safe, feel valued, feel that sense of belonging. And if we can create a workplace where we're all working towards that together, um, I mean, maybe it sounds utopian, but I don't think it's that it's that complicated. So I'll pause there, but um, hopefully that helps inspire some practitioners who may feel a little bit bogged down in boiling the ocean. There are ways to keep it simple and, and focused so that you can drive your energy in a way that's actually driving impact. Well, thank you, Erin. Yeah, I'm all for utopian ideals. I mean, I work in a mission-driven environment. And you know, when we look at missions for organizations like Pride of Work Canada, they're not like small little things that we can achieve in a day. They're big lofty ambitions that we have. So I'm all for those utopian ideals. Um, we've got a lot of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, so I'm gonna try and address as many as I can that are kind of broadly applicable, applicable excuse me, to all of our panelists. And um, you know, one of the things that's come up is this uh, again and again in our conversation is this idea of collapsing hierarchies. You just mentioned it, Aaron, about kind of redistributing power in the, in the workplace. Um, and I'm really interested, Ivan, uh, maybe first you and then Ryan, um, you know, because you both also mentioned this, do you have any other kind of additional points or tips for our audience on how they can drive that type of change uh, in their workplace based on your experience? Did you want to go first, Ryan? Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, I think for me, it's just listening um, and understanding and paying attention and then taking it to heart and figuring out a way to make a new blueprint because the, I feel like as an Indigenous producer, as an Indigenous creator working in this industry, there wasn't really any space available uh, or it, well, there was, it was just, it was, it was just not a let in. Um, and now I'm making this whole new blueprint for this. Um, so it's, it's a really hard question to answer and I wish I can give you points, but I'm really learning how to do this myself as I go. Um, you know, there has been things that were a lot harder than others in terms of, you know, hearing everybody and listening to everybody and trying to make this cohesive like structure for it to work um i'm glad that nobody has never left angry or hurt or not seen or heard um but it, like it's an ongoing process this blueprint that we're making and learning how to de deconstruct um 
this this hierarchy structure and turning it into a circle like in my community it's kind of it's already embedded with the way that we think and the way that we do things um you know people might be you know spearheading something but we all have our like you know like we all are heard and seen about that thing being done because this person might have the necessary skills to make whatever we're doing come together but they're also listening to everybody around them to make it work and that's what i'm trying to do um as best as i can um but yeah i feel like the structure is 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 it's a blueprint and it's it's, it's ongoing it's evolving um and just just do your best like listen um pay attention um and and it, i don't want to say it'll work itself out there is a ton of work you have to do to make it work but just just have faith in yourself and that you can do it and that's exactly what i'm doing um i wish i had a better answer than that but that that's that's the answer i got <laughs> i think it's a great answer ryan because i mean what i'm hearing from you is that if a leader is just talking 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 all the time they're not listening and what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, you need to cast that wide net of capturing feedback from folks and really stay agile and respond to it as it comes in and not think that as a leader, um, you know, as somebody leading a production, you don't have all the answers. You're going to have to get those answers from your team. So that's what I took from, from your statement. I think it's, I think it's a very valuable. Um, so Ivan, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this idea of kind of collapsing hierarchies. Yeah, well, um, I would echo everything that Ryan just said for sure, and um, also, uh, and again, it I I think it echoes my earlier point, which is that um, when I go into a school to do advocacy work, I I don't like the I don't like the word advocate, but when I when I go into school to you know tell stories and engage in conversations when I enter into any kind of an organization and I'm there as the, you know, um, I feel like, again, that I can't ask people to be my ally without that being a reciprocal, without that being a reciprocal engagement. So that, that puts the responsibility upon me to represent uh, myself and the issues that are, are, uh, most directly affect me, but the, the the flip side of that is is I have to look who's standing beside me and 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 care about and listen to their issues. So, like you know, I I feel really strongly that um, uh, I need to be aware of and uh, up to date on and well read about indigenous indigenous issues in this country that we now call Canada. And especially right now with the 215 and like we need to be engaged. And so I can't go to any organization or school or group of people or community and only advocate for my issues. It's, it, it's, it doesn't work that way. And, and I, when I tell students this, the way I get them to see it, it's like the, I always say like there's more bullied than there are bullies. We just have to organize. So if you think because you're, you're not queer that homophobia doesn't matter to you, you know, or if you think because you're not, um, you know, a person of color or an indigenous person or a black person that, you know, racism doesn't matter, it shouldn't, doesn't matter to you, then you're not seeing who your allies are and you're not being, holding yourself accountable and responsible. You're again, just coming to a community and asking for your needs to be met without reciprocating what it truly means to be an ally. Because, and I know that's a hot button word, people don't like it, but I like the word allied. And not just because it's allied van lines either, which I'd also like their t-shirt, but because I like allied. I like the concept that we are in each other's corners and that we have each other's backs. And if you looked around at, at your average workplace and you took the indigenous people and the trans people and the queer people and the immigrant people and the people who are not white and the the disabled people and you gathered us all up together we will always almost always um be larger numbers if you include the whole organization not just the the brass or the or the bosses or the heavies or whatever but if you actually took all the workers and and you and you valued each each and everything that those workers bring to the table and then you took a look at who they all are that there's a lot of built-in allies but we just need to 
to we need to see each other and we need to care about each other's um uh uh, uh, we have to care about each other's, you know, um, basic human dignities. And that involves a lot of learning and a lot of listening, like Ryan said, and a lot of reading and educating yourself, you know, and, uh, you know, they, they talk about like a water cooler talk or like, you know, coffee break talk or whatever. And, you know, I, I, I'm like, I'm now I'm like, cite your sources. Like, okay, have your opinion, but tell me where you got that opinion from. Cause it's like, well, my friend Dave said, I'm like, that's not good enough. Like do your reading and then you can show up and you can say some bullshit at work around the water cooler, but you better be able to back it up and you better be able to be educated about it. And yeah, anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you, Ivan. You know, we're coming um, up on the time that we have for our conversation, um, but I want to give each of you the opportunity to kind of wrap things up and, and provide our audience with um, some kind of takeaway that they can that they can use um, when they go back to work either today or tomorrow or next week. Uh, you know, I know that from this conversation, I'm taking away that when we truly create spaces in which people can feel safe to share feedback or ideas, um, that's when we truly get engagement um, from our colleagues and uh, from, from those who we work with. Um, and I think creating that as, you know, Aaron was talking about earlier, that kind of space of psychological safety and by collapsing some of those, um, you know, hierarchical notions that we have about who should be in charge, um, we might start to achieve that. So I'm really interested, Aaron, maybe we can hear from you first um on your kind of final thoughts uh, about today's topic for our audience and what they can hopefully take away sure you know what's coming to mind is find something that's working well and build from that so in the context of finning we have a really ingrained safety culture safety systems and safety shares and so what we do, we've done is we've expanded the scope of our safety shares and we've started to embed respect and inclusion and belonging into the safety system throughout the whole organization and um, yeah, just just don't try to reinvent the wheel and build something on the side. Integrate, 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 embed, build, and expand. Um, and all the power to you. So I guess I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Ryan, what's your takeaway for our audience? Um, I mean, I would just say what I always say to myself is lead with love, lead with education, lead with understanding, um, and, and do the best that you can do. Um, don't try to do everything. Uh, and, you know, self-care is really important. So please, um, you know, keep, keep self-care in mind as well. That's, a, that's what I would say. Thanks, Ryan. And Ivan, your final thoughts and takeaways for our audience. Well, I guess like if there's employers out there, um, you know, I think there's this, I like to flip the conversation a lot of times. And, you know, I, I tell this to schools too, like, oh, you have a trans student, like, oh, now what do we have to do to accommodate? And it's like, actually, the process of meeting the, the basic needs of human dignity for that trans student will make that entire school safer for everybody. And it's not just students who walk into to, to schools either. It's employees, custodial staff, admin staff, elect, you know, there's all kinds. So I would say to employers, like, if you provide for your, for your employees, um, you know, basic facilities, a safe er workplace, if you address stuff, if you, if you, if once you, when you do that thing, what you will get is an extremely loyal employee who will bring their very best self to work. People don't want to hate their job. They don't want to hate the people they work with. The, and think about the, your job and how you might have had a shitty job, but you love the people that you worked with and you made it fun to be there together. Like I th I'm thinking of digging ditches and I'm thinking of this guy, Colin, that I worked with, who was hilarious. And I could have dug ditches with that guy all day because he was fun to be around. So if you provide for your employees, yeah. Actually, you're not going to, it's not going to cost you. It's going to save you because it's going to save you money. If that's all you care about is money um, uh, because those employers are going to stick around and you're not going to have to train new people all the time. And you're going to have people that you can delegate to, and you're going to have long-term employees. And all of those things are going to result in a, in a more stable, um, productive and uh, uh, workplace. And so, so there's so much, there's, 
with very little investment that's actually going to be like I keep saying about the bathrooms none of those dudes wanted to like you know so so you're you're meeting the needs of everyone when you meet the needs of the so-called minority or the so-called marginal I don't like the term marginalized I find it marginalizing but um you know if you if you do that then there's so many more benefits um and uh you know just having a more diverse workplace um, is, is, is a, that's just a surface benefit. You know, you'll, you'll have a, you'll have a smarter, more efficient, uh, more interesting, engaging and healthy workplace. And you'll have less of the other, you'll have less accidents. You'll have less sexual harassment. You'll have less, you know, of that. It, it, there's so much more to be gained than just, uh, the, the surface, uh, benefits. Well, thank you for that, Ivan. I know th that a lot of employers that we hear from at Pride of Work Canada are focused on um, diversity through the lens of recruitment and how are we going to diversify um, the talent pool for applications. But what I'm hearing from all three of our panelists today is that this idea of creating an inclusive environment is as much about retention as it is about attracting um, new employees from lots of different communities. So I just want to thank all three of you for being so open and honest. Um, Ivan, thank you so much for using the power of storytelling to illustrate some of your experiences and how our audience can learn to create um, uh, better workplaces uh, for them. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for sharing your entrepreneurial spirit and how that has benefited not only you, but other folks who have similar experiences in your industry. And Aaron, thank you so much for the pioneering work that you're doing um, in an industry that, like I said, has a stereotype around it for not being super inclusive, but we at Pride of Work Canada know um, there's so much um, really good work being done by fabulous professionals like yourself um, in, the, in the area of skilled trades and manufacturing. Um, so once again, thank you so much to the audience for all of our all of the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get through all of them, uh, but we really do encourage you to connect with our panelists on social media and connect with uh, Pride of Work Canada after if you would have uh, if you have other questions and you'd like further resources. So um, Ivan, Ryan, and Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to turn our cameras off now, turn our audio off now, and turn it back to Claire. Um, Claire, um, the event is in your capable hands. Thanks so much, Colin. Um, so yeah, thanks to Colin, our wonderful moderator. Thanks so much to our panelists, Aaron, Ivan, and Ryan. I feel like we've all learned a lot about dignity um, and the need to feel respected. And I love that analogy with community and looking at it not as a library, but as an act of engagement where you're able uh, to reciprocate. Um, it's an energy exchange. And from the, building on what the under, other panelists have said, uh, looking at what's working well and building upon that, not, in, not having to reinvent the wheel, making sure that you're listening and leading with love and understanding and really just doing your best. I want to thank our sponsor again, uh, the Inclusive Workplace Supply Council of Canada. And I also want to thank you, the attendees. Uh, thanks for sticking with us for this past hour and a half. I hope that you've learned a lot and you're able to apply these insights uh, in your journey. Just want to note again, this session was recorded um, and it will be posted on YouTube once our pro Pride programming has concluded um, and links and documents will be sent out to attendees. I think there might be a slide in here about, uh, yeah, our website and please go to our e-learning portal. Um, there's a discount code there, Dignity23, that's valid until June 30th. So if you are interested in learning the LGBTQ2 plus uh, 101 basics uh, and getting a certificate, please check out our website. And our upcoming events, I noted at the top of the session that we do have another Pro Pride event coming up on July 14th, exploring uh, moving beyond equity towards justice. And if you are a member of Pride at Work Canada, there is a national webinar on July 7th and another workshop on July 21st. Um, and I'm seeing here in the chat, the slide deck will be shared tomorrow in case you want to explore these links um, 
and the resources page, um, giving links to some of the things that our panelists um, have spoken about. Um, if you wanna plug again, Ivan's book, um, if you are looking to buy Care Of, maybe check out a local bookstore instead of an online super magnet, just so that you can support local business. Lastly, I'm going to close our session by passing us back to Elder Albert McLeod. Um, I love the phrase you had, uh, letting us know that we don't exist in isolation. So love to hear from you again, Albert. Uh, thank you, Claire and panelists. It's been very enlightening about some of the ch challenges that people face. Uh, and we are all invested in decolonization and reconciliation. You know, Canada is a young nation. We're only 150 years old, uh, but we are one, you know, of three uh, civil societies that have apologized to our LGBTQ2 citizens for the suppression and oppression uh, in that era of colonization. And I think for many of us, uh, we may be the ones that do that leadership role in educating, uh, uh, you know, sit situations, employers about uh, our rights uh, that we're uh, fought for. And I just want to say, my uncle went to fight in World War II at the age of 19 and was fighting uh, fascism and homophobia and transphobia. And I think about that, that, that freedom that he fought for is what I get to live today. So I don't take it for granted. And, and we have legislation uh, at, at our federal and provincial levels and in First Nations uh, level, governance level as well, that protect and uphold our rights. And, and so I, I, I like to, you know, live in that uh, understanding that, you know, uh, he died very young and didn't get to experience that freedom he fought for, but I do as his nephew. So, so I never, uh, you know, discount that contribution. And that's why I do stand up where there is oppression around LGBTQ2 uh, uh, discrimination, and that uh, particularly in the area of employment. So thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you again in the future.